Hey everybody, thank you so much for joining us for week two of our Freedom Study. We're so glad you're here, whether you're watching this video in one of our in-person groups, or uh, maybe you're watching with one of your online groups, or maybe you're just stopping into the Freedom Resource page to see what Freedom is all about. Uh, we're so glad you're here. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, in this week, we're going to be talking about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you were with us last week, Pastor Chris Hodges from Church of the Highlands in Birmingham, Alabama, was with us to share uh, a little bit about uh, the Freedom Study, what it is, the scope of it. Uh, and he, in his message, he really kicks off um, with this idea that there's two fundamental approaches to God. We can approach God through religion, or we can approach God through relationship. And, and the first one is really summed up in this idea of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And if we're honest with ourselves, many of us find uh, that we come into this relationship with God with hurts and habits and hang-ups uh, that really keep us from living the free life that we know that we're called to live. And so what we want to talk about before we really dive into this material is, is that really a how did we get here moment. And so the theme verse for this entire week comes from Genesis. is Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. It says, But the Lord God warned him, him being Adam, you may eat the fruit of every tree in the garden except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat its fruit, you are sure to die. Well, that seems like a pretty tall order coming from God to Adam, and it seems um, kind of like a harsh punishment for eating out of the wrong tree. But what we have to realize here is that in this verse really sets up God's approach to us. Uh, God does not give threats, but God does give warnings. And in this, God is saying that there are there is tons of life-giving opportunities out there. But there are certain things that you should not do and you should not approach them because if you do it this way, then you're ultimately going to have fruit that leads to death. So remember, God doesn't give threats, but He does give warnings. So let's break down the two approaches that we see Adam and Eve uh, facing in the garden. The first approach is the tree of life. It says that this tree, like the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, was actually planted in the middle of the garden. It was easy to find and uh, its fruit was beautiful, but there was something about this other tree that was appealing. But let's talk about the fruit of the tree of life first. The, the fruit of the tree of life is freedom, it's grace, it's, it's life-giving. This tree sees God as relational. It sees God as forgiving. And the most important part of this is that when we eat out of this tree of life, and, and, and keep in mind that this tree really represents an approach to God, it sees that our motivation to serve God is internal. We don't serve God and obey God because we're afraid of what He might do to us if we don't. We serve God out of a place of love. We know who God is. We live in the, in the life that He gives us. And out of an overflow, our response is to be obedient and do what He tells us to do. Now, the second approach is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And, and for me and, and many others, this is the tree that we have a temptation to swing back even after we've come into a relationship with God because there's something on the inside of us that wants to earn it. Now, this tree sees... Um, an approach to God, and, and this, the fruit of this tree leads to bondage. It leads to the law. It leads to death. It sees God as this judge sitting on a throne ready to hit you when you mess up. It, it sees God as condemning. And the real big differentiator between this tree and the tree of life is the motivation is external. In this approach, we're always approaching God because we're afraid of what God might do to us if we don't. We, we, uh, we hide when we mess up. We uh, run when we are afraid. And so what we want to do is make sure that the first step of freedom is swinging from this tree back to the tree of life, the tree that we're called to eat out of. Now the first step to that, uh, first step to freedom in that process is understanding that our authority over sin comes from a relationship with God. You know, the first step towards freedom is entering into a relationship with God. Now, so many times we, uh, we get this backwards. We feel like a relationship with God is dependent on our authority over of sin. If we can just get it right, if we can stop doing that thing that we know we shouldn't be doing, if we can let go of, of things that really uh, keep us from being who we were called to be, if we can finally muster up the strength to forgive the person who we've been holding bitterness towards. And we think if we can do those things, then we'll, then we'll be okay with God. 
But that's not how God sees it at all. In fact, he sees it as the opposite. He says, if you'll just come into a relationship with me, if you'll just love me, if you'll just let me love you, then we'll worry about those other things later. Because in your own strength, you don't have authority over those things anyway. But if you come into relationship with me, then I'll give you the authority that you need in order to overcome whatever it is in your life that's keeping you from living the life that you were called to live. Now, let's talk about a story. Uh, it's, it's the story in the Bible where we actually see uh, Eve fall. And whether or not you realize that this is all of our story, at some point in our life, we've lived out this, uh, uh, this, our own version of this story. We've, we've lived in a way where uh, there was something that was tempting to us and we gave into it. And it wasn't necessarily the action that we did as much as it was taking on a bad way of thinking. So let's take a look at that story. This is from Genesis chapter 3. Verse 1, it says, The serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. And one day he asked the woman, Did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? She replies, Of course we may eat from the trees in the garden. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we're not allowed to eat. And God said, You must not eat it or even touch it, for if you do, you will die. And the serpent replies, You won't die. God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it, and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. The woman was convinced, and she saw that the tree was beautiful, and its fruit looked delicious, and she wanted the wisdom of it. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it too. At that moment, their eyes were opened, and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. And when the cool of the evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking about in the garden. So they hid from the Lord God among the trees. And I love this verse, verse 9. Then the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? And so some, some way, some form, we all have a way of fitting into this story. Where we were created and we were in right standing with God. And somewhere along the way, we believed something that was counter to what He's already told us. And because of that, it leads us to a place of shame. It leads us to a place of guilt. It leads us to a place of running further away from the only one who's qualified to help us. But in that same story, we all share this common denominator, and that is no matter what we've done, no matter how far we've gone, that there is a God who's walking in the garden, calling out to us, where are you? I love this. Even in their weakest moment, even in the moment where they were uh, uh, living in sin, we see God chasing after them. And from this story, the rest of the Bible is God's story of bridging that gap to us, to, to take on the punishment that we deserve through, through what Jesus did for us on the cross and, um, and ultimately uh, being restored so we can live out of that tree of life once again. Well, let's talk about the fruit that comes with the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And we can see this fruit in this story that we just read. The first thing that we see about the fruit is the fruit is knowledge. You know, and we know that we all possess knowledge, but knowledge puffs up where love builds up. There wasn't anything wrong with their desire to know more about God. In fact, that was a good thing. They wanted to know God. But the problem is, is they were going about it the wrong way. Rather than trying to know God by coming to God and asking Him to reveal Himself to them, they go to another source to find out information about God. They try to find God through religion and not relationship. Now we know that knowledge is not a bad thing. In fact, in the Bible it also says that God's people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. But knowledge can't be the only source of, of us coming into this relationship with God. Because what we see is that Knowledge can transform the mind, but love has a way of transforming the heart. And so if we're trying to move forward, if we're trying to get beyond the things that keep us from being who we're called to be, we have to understand that it's God's love working in us that's going to give us the boost to change us into who uh, He wants us to be. Let's take a look at the second attribute of this fruit. The fruit is deadly. When Adam and Eve ate the fruit, they didn't die physically, they died spiritually. Spiritually. 
And so this is important to see because sometimes we, we fear that physical death is the, is the worst thing that can happen to us, but the reality is a spiritual death is so much worse. Because in a spiritual death, we're separated from the tree of life. We're separated from the presence of God. And we can live life on this earth, but be dead people walking. And so it's God's desire to get us to a place where we can eat from the tree of life, to accept what, God, or what Christ has done for us, so that we can live in freedom and joy and peace uh, in this world uh, as well. Now, it's impossible, to it's impossible to have access to both of these trees at the same time. Sometimes we want to uh, come into this relationship with Christ knowing that it's His grace that saved us, but as soon as we enter into that relationship, sometimes we want to swing back to the other tree and, and believe that it's our righteousness and our obedience that's going to keep us saved. And what we have to realize is that His grace is not only that which saves us, but it's also that which sustains us. It keeps us going. It picks us up when we miss the mark. And so in order to have life, we've got to stay plugged in to the tree of life and stay plugged in in a relationship with God. Let's take a look at this third attribute. The fruit is consumed. Now the woman was convinced. Take a look at that word because it's important. She saw that the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious. She wanted the wisdom it would give her, so she took some of the fruit and ate it. And then she gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it too. Now the reason that this is so important is because what we see here is that the battle really was won in the mind. The woman was convinced. Before she ever touched it, there was something going on in her head. She changed her way of thinking. She stopped living out of the tree of life. She stopped seeing the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil as God had called it, and she started seeing it through a new lens. Now this happens to all of us if we're not careful. We begin to see things in the world a different way. We see it through a worldly lens. When, when we live out of the tree of life and live in relationship with God, we have a clearer perspective to see things as God sees them. And it's also important to see here that Adam, her husband, was with her when this happened. So Adam was not tricked. Adam was not deceived. Adam was standing right there all along and was convinced just like she was. You see, the progression that we see here is that sin starts in the mind and not with the act. In our own life, it's the same way. The sin starts in the mind, not with the act. And because of that, we have to realize that everything that we consume affects our mind. And so if we're living on a worldly diet, if we're filling ourselves with things that are not good, then we have to understand that whatever we put on the hard drive is going to stay there. And so we want to make sure that we're filling ourselves with good things, with life-giving things. That could be uh, Christian music. It could be uh, hanging out with Christian friends. It could mean uh, listening to sermons. It could mean getting in your Bible and praying and, and surrounding yourself with the life-giving Word of God. Because when you do that, uh, you're, you're putting good things in your mind that, that can prevent you from falling into the trap of being tempted to see things as otherwise. Let's take a look at this last attribute. This, the fruit causes separation. The man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Now what's so sad about this is that God never told them to run away. God never told them to hide. It was a result of their actions that caused them to feel this shame on the inside that made them run away from the God who was actually looking for them. And you know, this may be an experience that feels familiar to you. you. You do these things that you know you shouldn't do, and when you do them, you feel so guilty, the last thing you want to do is pray again. The last thing you want to do is read your Bible. The last thing you want to do is go to church, because you feel like you're just this big disappointment to God. And the reality is, is that when we find ourselves hiding, God is actually on the look, lookout for us. He, he's trying to find us. But this cycle that shows up in our life is, is one that uh, it can be really a repetitive of, of sin cycle that we can get trapped in. And the first is sin. We do something we shouldn't do. Uh, then we find ourselves feeling shame about it. We feel guilty. And our shame leads us to a place of solitude. And it's in our solitude that we actually find ourselves uh, without that life-giving source. So we find ourselves sinning again, and then we feel more shame and more lonely, and, and back again, and sin and shame and loneliness. And, and the last thing uh, that 
that God wants for us is that. In fact, He created us to live in joy and peace and community. And so uh, this is the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. In fact, if you could sum it up, the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is this. It's shame and victimization. Take a look at verses 10 through 13. It says, He replied, I heard you walking in the garden. He is Adam talking to God. He says, I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. I was afraid because I was naked. And then look at what God says. He says, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat? I love that God's asking a question that he already knows the answer to. And the man replies, it was the woman you gave me who gave me the fruit and I ate it. So right here, Adam's actually trying to shift the blame back to Eve. And then we see the Lord, God asked the woman, well, what have you done? So in this, we see that the result of living out of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is not just this feeling of shame where you feel like the, you have to hide and you're guilty, but it's actually a victimization. It's a victim mentality. When we get sucked into this tree, we, really, we, we never want to take responsibility for our own mistakes. We want to shift the blame to somebody else. And we see here that Adam's actually shifting the blame to woman, but he's also shifting the blame back to God and says, it was the woman that you gave me. And so, in this, we see that this victim mentality prevents them from actually finding freedom. It prevents them from even asking for an apology. It's just a blame game. Now, the results of shame are this, and this appears in each and every one of our life. The first is covering up our own, in, our own inadequacies with religion and becoming focused on works. The second is lying and deception and false pride. We, we tell ourselves that uh, if we only uh, had this, if we only had that opp opportunity, if, if we were in charge, we would do it differently. Three, making promises that we can't keep. This may be uh, a promise to God saying, God, I promise I'm never going to do that thing again. It may be making a promise to your family that uh, you're not going to act that way anymore. And uh, Number four, getting our self-worth from things that we do uh, rather than who God has said that we are. Five, an inability to be honest and transparent before God because we believe that we have no true value. And six, concentrating on our sin more than our Savior. And this really is the, uh, the, 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 the thing for most of us. And that is that whenever we find ourselves stuck in our sin, we, we can't focus on Christ because we're so busy trying to fix ourselves before we go to Him uh, anyways. But let's take a look at the results of victimization. Uh, the victim mentality creates a uh, uh, place where we notice other sin but not our own. Number two, we excuse and condemn ourselves saying, this was the hand that I was dealt. I can't change. I'm not good enough. Three, we feel rejected. So shame and victimization really are the fruit of living out of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They're the fruit of religion. They're the fruit of approaching God from a place of external knowledge rather than a relationship with Him. So as we go through this freedom study, our desire for you is to see you move from this tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and move to a place where you're eating freely out of the tree of life, living in relationship with God, accepting what He's done for you, accepting the grace that He's given to you, so you can begin to live in freedom and have authority over the things in your life that are holding you back. Thank you so much for joining us for week two. We look forward to connecting with you again in week three.